Hi, I'm Jennifer Taylor in the Baylor College of Medicine Department of Urology, and I'm going to speak with you for a few minutes about immunotherapy in bladder cancer. I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. The objectives are that I will go over the indication that is newly approved for immunotherapy in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Dr. Yen will then talk about the indications for immunotherapy in muscle invasive disease and advanced urothelial cancer, and we will both touch on some of the clinical trials that are active in this space. We must first consider the evolution where immunotherapy for urothelial cancer began with approvals first in advanced urothelial cancer. Investigations were then expanded into the neoadjuvant and adjuvant spaces before and after cystectomy. And then investigators have taken it a step further or a step back into a less aggressive and less lethal version of bladder cancer in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Some of the considerations include the risk benefit ratio, such that patients and clinicians may be war more willing to accept adverse events when the stakes or cancer risks are higher. And so we have to be aware of these risks that may be unique to the treatment when we're talking about a less lethal cancer. And we also must think about and be aware of the cost. We should also not forget that BCG was the earliest immunotherapy and it is still the backbone of treatment for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. In the current era, where BCG is not available as widely as it once was. There has been guidance that says that we should reserve BCG only for the highest risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer cases. This is guidance that came from the AUA in conjunction with the SUO and the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. And it now states that full dose BCG should be used only for high risk category non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, which we know would include large high grade TA tumors, high-grade T1 tumors, and any patient with carcinoma in situ. BCG on responsive non invasive bladder cancer is very important as well to talk about before we get to immunotherapy because this definition came in 2015 and was revised in 2018 in conjunction with the FDA to try to harmonize the definition so that drugs being investigated could make it through the regulatory process and get to market. It also helped us standardize how we introduce trials to patients. This states that a patient must receive adequate BCG, which includes a minimum of five of six doses of induction to be classified as BCG unresponsive. If a patient has high grade T1 at the first evaluation after adequate induction, that bladder cancer is considered automatically BCG unresponsive. In addition, if there is recurrent CIS with or without papillary disease within 12 months of completing an adequate round of induction, plus either a repeat induction or a maintenance course, that also is classified as BCG unresponsive. The third category is if there is recurrent or persistent papillary disease within six months of adequate BCG. There are still other definitions such as BCG intolerant, uh, but generally speaking, these definitions are now applied for clinical trials and for treatment. This schematic helps us see this visually where a patient with high-risk disease receives induction BCG, minimum five doses, and if they have a negative cysto and cytology, they go on to get maintenance BCG. If that same patient has a positive clinic cystoscopy or cytology, they'll be taken to the operating room. And if in the operating room we find high-grade T1, that patient is automatically BCG unresponsive. In another scenario, there may be high-grade TA or TIS only, and in that case, we would recommend repeat induction BCG. In either of these scenarios, after now what is considered adequate BCG, if the patient goes on and has a full response with negative cystoscopy and negative cytology, we would continue per protocol on maintenance BCG. If, however, the patient has a new occurrence of TIS or high-grade TA or high-grade T1, that patient is then classified as BCG unresponsive. So pembrolizumab was approved in January of this year for BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. The data was first presented at 2019 ASCO with 102 patients in a single arm phase two trial. And then the data were updated uh, based on two years of follow-up at ASCO 2020. In that, in that report, there were 96 patients in the efficacy analysis. It's important to know that there are considered two cohorts, and cohort A is the only one that has been reported so far. This would include patients that have CIS with or without papillary TA or T1 disease. 
cohort B would be papillary disease without any CIS. And this shows how the patient in the study was evaluated. There would be pembrolizumab given every three weeks through IV, uh, and then very um, regu regulated and regimented evaluations by cystoscopy and cytology, and there were also disease assessments by biopsy. If a patient continued to have no evidence of recurrence, they could continue on treatment up to 24 months. Otherwise, if they were taken off of treatment, they would go on to whatever next treatment was discussed or indicated. This Kaplan-Meier curve shows that the complete response weight was 41%, and the median duration of response was 16 months. Among those 39 patients who had a complete response, 46% had a complete response greater than 12 months. And notably, there were no instances of progression to muscle invasive or metastatic bladder cancer while on treatment. The median progression-free survival and overall survival were not reached. So these were very, very favorable results for a disease space where the alternative and the gold standard is radical cystectomy. So when considering if this is the right choice for your patient who is classified as BCG unresponsive, it's also important to look at the characteristics of those who were enrolled. And the majority of patients, two thirds, had carcinoma in situ only. Another 25 patients had carcinoma in situ plus TA high grade disease. And only 12 patients had carcinoma in situ plus T1 high grade. The reason for entry was 97 patients declined radical cystectomy. Three were considered ineligible based on comorbidities, and there were several that were unknown reasons. The response rates, like I went over, were that 41% had a complete response, and that complete response was observed greater than 12 months, so relatively durable, in almost 20% of the original group. And there were notably no patients progressing to muscle invasive or metastatic disease, which is important when counseling a patient on what are the risks. So the important takeaways are that pembrolizumab is a newly available option for BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. This data is early and so far only reports on those that have carcinoma in situ with or without papillary tumor. But the side effect profile that's observed in this study and across all other studies using pembrolizumab for urothelial cancer show that it's a very well tolerated drug. There are rare but serious immune related adverse events that we should be aware of in monitoring the patients. I will say that these patients are generally referred to your medical oncology colleague and you would then do surveillance with them in conjunction. These immune related side effects typically respond or resolve with corticosteroid treatment. And there are some other long lasting but manageable common side effects such as endocrinopathies. There are many other treatments now under investigation in this space. The one that's closest to approval is an adenoviral vector interferon called matopharagene. And this one is currently being considered by the FDA as an intravesical treatment for BCG unresponsive disease. And when looking this week on clinicaltrials.gov, there were at least 15 trials listed that were studying immunotherapy with or a novel agent in conjunction with BCG or gemcitabine or tezolizumab on its own. So for this very unique population who are stuck with no further treatment with BCG and the only alternative being radical cystectomy, there is now a number of studies coming down and we are very glad to see there is one FDA approved drug in this space. Thank you for your attention.